Good afternoon. Now we will now resume with today's agenda. We will now have a tutorial, proper traffic engineering at an IXP. We have with us Eduardo Morales, Antonio Moreiras, Tiago Nakamura, Wanderson Modesto da Silva, and Lucas da Silva. So we invite you to come up. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Everything, everyone ready? I'm Wardenson. Together with Lucas, Eduardo, and Tiago, we're now back. We were here on Monday when we had the tutorials, and today we are once again here. I'd like to thank LACNIC for the invitation. Today we will be speaking about proper traffic engineering at an EXP, IXP. So how can you realize, as you realize we're going to speak in Portuguese, if you need the interpretation, you can pick this up at the entrance and select the language of your preference. So let us start speaking about how to do proper traffic engineering at an IXP. So before starting, what we would like to do is to uh, go back. Uh, so, so those who are already converted to this, we know that this is a technical community. Many of you, therefore, know what an IX is, how IXs work. It's not IX, it PR. But we're also going to speak and tell you about what an IX is, for those of you who are not so familiar with this topic, what BGP is, how to use BGP, and how to use BGP for traffic engineering. So those of you who are following us remotely can also learn about this. We're going to, going to speak about, as I said, good traffic engineering. So let's start. The first thing that we have to remind or recall is that internet is composed by diverse networks that are connected. The technical term with which we call these are the ASs or autonomous systems. So we use the acronym, we have the ASs. The ASs or autonomous systems need to relate to one another. They need to connect with other autonomous systems. And so we can speak about two main types of relationship that we'll be describing now. The first is transit. This is when an AS is connected with another AS through transit, it means that it provides a path to access the entire internet. So they can connect to all the other networks in the internet and all the other autonomous systems. So this is to provide transit, in other words, a path to be able to access or reach a given type of content that they wish to access. Another type of relation that we know is what we call peering. Peering is the relationship where a given autonomous systems will then exchange traffic with the other. So they're going to provide access to its own entire to its own network. In other words, this is offered to the clients. The, the clients can have access to the contents, but they do, are not shown the path. They just speak with one another, and then they can see all 
the structure that they have at that IAS. So what we normally say is that when we have a transit relationship, this is something that you pay for. I have to pay to provide transit, to have transit in order to have a path to access the internet. So when we have a peering relationship, that payment in general involves consensus, a mutual agreement between the different parties, and in this case, between two ASs that think this will be positive. So in general terms, this does not involve any financial uh, situation when we speak about peering in the internet. Now here, it, it, well, in general terms, we know that it is unfeasible well, we have more than 100,000 autonomous systems, so it is impossible to be connected directly to each of these networks in the Internet. That is unfeasible. So this is how we can see in the AS38, which is the first cloud at the top. That's the first autonomous system. And if that autonomous system wishes to speak with any of the other ASs, this connection has to be done and they have to connect with each of the others. So would that be feasible at all? So this is the first consideration that we have to make when we have more than 100 thousand networks of autonomous systems distributed throughout the internet. So in addition to the geographical issues, we're also going to see the cost of establishing the links. So it is quite unfeasible. So it might occur, and this is where we will start speaking about the Internet exchanges, Internet exchanges or IXs are the traffic exchange points. These allow you to connect to a central point, and there you will be able to directly connect to all the other ASs. So in other words, AS38 doesn't need to send a link to number 37 or 40, 41 or 42 or 39. They connect directly to a point, in this case, to the IX, the Internet Exchange, and all the other S's connect to that point. In that way, they manage to have a direct, direct connection through layer two. This is the link, and you don't have to send a link to each of the autonomous systems. Now, here, we're going to enter into the Internet Exchange point, the IXP. In Brazil, they are known as PTT. So we have this infrastructure not only in Brazil, but it also in other countries. So the autonomous systems can connect and exchange traffic directly with other autonomous systems. And this without the need of being directly connected and without needing to have a cable from one AS to all the other ASs. Now, this central point will facilitate that, and we don't need to have smaller connections with all the other traffic exchange points. So going back to the example, we have AS38 that needs to connect with all the others. So they need to communicate with the neighboring ones. So, so it can connect to AS39 because AS39 provides a path to the internet, but this is not done directly. All the packets, all the traffic that has to be sent to AS42 has to go through AS39, then through AS40, and also through AS41 until it finally reaches the destination, which is AS42. So this fact will go through some intermediary networks. When we have a traffic exchange point where all the ASs are connected to that point, then AS38 can send packets directly to AS42 without the need of going through an intermediary network. 
this is good, and this is what we try to do. Regarding ix.br, ix.br has metropolitan or regional coverage, so we try to promote interconnection with the autonomous systems in the region. This allows that everything that is in the proximity can then be connected at a lower latency in terms of speed. And something that occurs when we organize courses and we speak about the traffic exchange points is that in Brazil, people might think that the ASs and the IXs in different cities are connected with one another, and that NIC.br, which is the organization that is in charge of Brazil's IXs, is connecting each of the IXs. But that is not the case. A traffic exchange point located in the city of Sao Paulo is not directly connected to the traffic exchange point of Rio de Janeiro or any other city in Brazil. NIC.br does not expect to do that. There are other ASs that might be in different IXPs or they can even be connected to different IXPs but they are not connected with one another. And this slide shows the structure of ix.br from Sao Paulo. This is the largest we have in Brazil. Here we can see all the other participants of this ix, of this exchange point. So you see here we have a data center, which we call PICS, which are interconnection points. So whoever needs to connect to the IX will need to connect to one of these points. This is the structure we have. So what we show in general terms so that this can be understood, it is like a big switch. You will have several data centers that are connected in layer two with a large switch. And Whoever needs, whoever wishes to connect to the IX will have to speak with one of these data centers so that they can access all the participants in that IX. Now, we will look at the paths that I mentioned at the beginning when I started. So if you need to know the paths and how to reach the internet, well, how do you achieve this? Lucas, you have the floor. All right, thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I'd like to thank LACNIC for the invitation to speak about IX.BR. It's not only IXBR, but also IX as a structure as a whole. So thank you for the clicker. So, my colleague mentioned how the IX infrastructure works, but it's you cannot speak about Internet Exchange if we don't speak about BGP. IXs are part of the Internet. In order to connect an IX, in order to exchange information with other autonomous systems, we have the BGP protocol who does that. BGP protocol is very simple in the way it works. It carries information on the prefixes, on the paths, it can go through until it reaches that prefix. And there are two autonomous systems that are connected through BGP in order to carry out that exchange. So we know that in the internet, there is not just one path for a given destination. Like in real life, when we get lost when we're driving and wish to reach a destination, we use the navigator and the navigator will estimate which is the best path where there is less traffic and if there are any roadworks. So BGP also has features that allow us to select the best path and also to have an influence on the best path because if you let the BGP to choose for you, they might not choose the ideal path for you. So we have the BGP attributes. Many of the BGP attributes that are used for traffic uh, used for traffic engineering. Some are just for the purpose of information. They carry information that we can use. 
Now, it is important that before we start doing network management using BGP, that we know which these attributes are and which is the device that is being used. These are BGP attributes, and you will see in this loop part, these are the ones that are well known. Normally, they are there in our device because these are mandatory attributes for the implementation of BGP. But we also have optional attributes. You don't need to have these in your device. These will be recognized. Now, if you know which are the attributes you have available to manage your traffic, it is then easier to use these. So, the first part, uh, the first part are the well-known attributes. They are contained in all the BGP implementations. We have the mandatory attributes that will always be present in the updates, and you always expect to receive these attributes when you close a BGP session. And then you have the optional attributes which are not contained in all the updates. So the mandatory attributes have AS path, next hop, and the origin. And the optional ones are local preference and atomic aggregate. Then we have the optional ones. These are optional ones. And these, it might happen that you might have, have these. We have the transitive and the non-transitive attributes. The transitive attributes are those that can be resent. You receive the attribute, you resend it with a peer with whom you are communicating, and it goes to another autonomous system. And the non-transitive attributes are those that are received but are not forwarded. One of the most well-known attributes is the AS path. And this is ultimately the path that you have to follow through the internet in order to reach destination. We cannot confuse AS path with the hops we do with the routers. The AS path is going to be stored in the autonomous system that you have to go through until you reach destination. So with that, the BGP decides the path to follow. So. If a path has five ASs along the way and another has only two, then it will select the shortest path because it will go through lesser autonomous systems. And this can be manipulated if this is repeated several times with prepend. So we'll check the outbound link. And if there are two outbound paths with two different types of traffic, but I put a prepend here, which triplicates my autonomous system. So the S is repeated three times. So the system will prefer to use the other one. Another attribute that is used a lot is it is necessary when you have two outbound links and you wish to choose a main link and a backup link that you wish to manipulate and decide how you're going to use these links. And there, you will prefer one or the other one of the other links. And so we need to see that that is not working for that case. We have a, so another attribute that is important to mention, and it will be discussed later in our presentation, is the local preference, which will influence there in the outbound traffic. Local preference is very well known. However, it is not uh, mandatory, so, so so certainly we'll have local preference uh, and uh, BGP. However, it is not in all the you can't use. It's not in all the uh, updates. Uh, you can use it or not. What are we going to do now? Once we know the attributes and once we more or less know how they work, we are going to consider some scenarios where we will be able to apply this uh, for a better decision making of our path in the internet. And now Eduardo is going to mention that 
All right. Now, talking of scenarios, I think that it would be interesting to understand how the attributes work, because we want to see how they are applied in an IXP. To understand it better, later on we're going to see more complex scenarios, but we have to understand we have the IX, that is a conjunction of a connections between autonomous systems. And there's an interesting thing. When we work with IX, essentially the way we work with uh, NIC VR, we have a route server. We have a connection with a route server that will replicate with some participants, but it won't change uh, in the middle of the road. So it's transparent when we exchange traffic. So it starts to change directly without going through the root server. It goes directly through the switch. So in theory, IX allows the autonomous systems to connect directly. So naturally, they allow us to have a, a shorter way of autonomous systems. And that is some, one of the things that uh, Lucas mentioned. So we have a shorter autonomous system path. For instance, we have AS4. That that is the route in, within IX and outside IX. When we are announcing it outside IX for its transit with AS3, then it will take it to the internet and maybe that route later will go to other participants of IX through other paths. So considering the example of AS1, receiving that route of AS4 through the internet that has a path that is longer than the IX that is there only with the AS that was not announced. So therefore, naturally, if there are no influences of traffic that are clear cut where AS1 may wish, for instance, to improve the local preference, the traffic will go through the IX because they're already directly connected. So connecting it to IX, you won't have to generate much traffic engineering. And the traffic will try to go that way, both in the inbound traffic where we are <coughs> disclosing the route, but in also with the inbound routes. So the other participants that are reporting that route to the IX will also be closer. So AS1 is, is transmitted to the internet, receives the path of some other, uh, where, through another path in IX. These are the screen uh, arrows. And we can see that IX, this is a shorter path. It has only one hop. But if it's outside IX, it has more than one hop. So naturally, the outbound traffic goes through IX2. So sometimes when you do IX connections, we are avoiding the adjustment of attributes because we already have a preference because we have a shorter path. Those are the comments that we need to consider when we think of the differences when we connect to IX. Then let's mention what happens when we are connected to several IXPs. Let's see what the preference will be like, whether one or the other will be chosen and what types of attributes will have to be altered to have an impact on our traffic. So naturally, without trying to add uh, to adjust the attributes with our IX and all the contents in it. So the information, uh, mm, with that information, we know that there's a very important attribute of BGP, that's the communities. The, there are some scenarios where you we we may use only certain standards, uh, certain patterns of uh, the. In, in some communities, you can work with traffic engineering, but there are some complex uh, topologies in which the use of communities will help uh, automate the infrastructure and also to make decisions faster. So first of all, we need to understand what the communities are about. It's a transitive and optional uh, attribute in BGP. And it's as if it were a stamp that we relate to a route. That stamp has different uh, aims. It may be just uh, for to, to uh, postmark it, to check it, to verify a route. It can be a stamp because we had uh, signed an agreement previously with another autonomous system, so we receive a route with that stamp. Then we have an action and we are having an impact uh, as 
um, for instance, when you uh, dispatch a, a, a parcel and you put a label that says uh, fragile, even if they don't know you, they'll know that they'll have to handle it with care. And the same if we have a route with no additional data, we are going to treat it in a certain way. But if we have a community related to that uh, uh, route, uh, we are going to treat it uh, differently. And today, there are three types of communities, standard, extended, and large. The standard ones are absolutely standard. They were created in 1996. They have two 16-bit uh, uh, fields, so that makes uh, 32 bits. And usually, we include our AS number and the community number that will identify this uh, community. However, there was a problem. We know that uh, the internet uh, it never stops growing, and uh, at a, there, at a time there, this there was no more space. Like with IPv4, there was no more space for the autonomous system that it had from 16 to 65,000, 1535. So. Well, they created the autonomous systems with 32 bits, but we only have 16 bits to identify our autonomous system in the standard community. So we needed to update it. And here we have an example of a community that exists in BX, BR um, that identifies the uh, place where it comes from. So we have uh, the one six. We 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 have. 26162 and then 65011 that identifies this route as coming from the IX of Sao Paulo. Here we have a list of communities that are very well known that are used broadly in the networks. And we also have uh, the IANA list where we can see the black hole or the graceful shutdown community. So if you're interested in these communities, you can check those lists that appear in the links. Then we have the extended communities. These communities were launched in the RFC 4360-2006, and they add two fields in the, the community. The sizes vary. They are, they are diverse. Uh, here we have 16 bits for the type of community. So with these extended communities, we have the possibility <coughs> of having more identifications, and we can increase uh, our granularity. And notice that the field of ASN continues to have 16 bits, so it doesn't solve the problem with autonomous systems that have a larger number. That is why we have the large communities. They're not so new. This is an RFC of 2017, RFC 1892 with uh, um, uh, 32 bits, and here we can include the ASNs with 32 bits, and the function is similar. It is you can identify the routes by using these communities. Here you have a list where we can see what kind of equipment already have support for these big communities, because you may notice that this was launched in 2017. So if you have devices prior to that date that were not uh, uh, they didn't receive any firmware update. They won't be able to receive these communities. Let us see how you can use these communities, as I mentioned earlier. You can simply <coughs> mark in these communities, leaving the uh, ID, or you can also use markings that may do something, and for you to do that, uh, or the person you are sending the community uh, for that, for, for some action. So let's see examples of uh, information <coughs> communities. Where did this route come from? It came from an IXP or an IRR. I may have received it from Afrinic. I may include um, a mark for that. Is this route of a client or a transit? So if we have the data, we can make decisions within our own area and traffic engineering. There's no standard, so we need to create our own rules 
not considering the communities that are very well known, but we can create our own communities. If you visualize transit and uh, communities, you need to pass them to your clients. You need to pass the list of communities that you use, because if you don't, the clients won't know how to use them. Just as when we do peering with someone and we have to agree it ahead of time, exactly the same thing happens with the communities. You may use some, how we use them for a purpose of information. You have to identify them ahead of time. Here we bring some suggestions of how we can use the communities. We have, for instance, this one standard. We have a S64500 and we have this separation TCP RET is a transit peering IX is a client, it's an internal route. The C is the continent. We have five continents. So we can't put them all. And then the country, we can use the country code, the region. For instance, in Brazil, we have five regions. You can identify it like that, too. So each identity has its own uh, status. So we can do it even more granular, reaching that level. Here we have another example. So. As I was telling you, these are the letters. Now we'll turn them into figures. Three is transit, one is America, five is Brazil, two represents the Southeast, and four represents Sao Paulo, that is one of the states in this region. So this is just an example of what we can do with an information community. Let us see now the large communities. You can do the same, but they have a different format, so you'll need to adapt them. Let's see some recommendations. We must not confuse an information community with an action community, because if we don't know what to do with the com that community, we may be automizing something. In the, and we should report something. And however, we are conducting actions within uh, the infrastructure. Don't let anybody else to send uh, information communities because we don't know what that information means. What are we going to do about it? So it will be useless uh, uh, information for our management. Now let's talk about the action communities. Wanderson will be in charge of this. Before we give the floor to Wanderson, I wanted to make a couple of comments about the communities. As my colleague mentioned, the communities are just a stamp, a seal, it's marking. Uh, you may even imagine it as a sort of real stamp. They, it doesn't have any sort of information. Let's assume that you have a stamp in your passport. That stamp is allowing you to get into or out of a country, but you have to give a function to that stamp because in itself it doesn't do anything. And here we have the same thing. We are including a stamp, a route stamp that has a definition, and then afterwards we have to relate something to that information. So as we were making these comments about the information communities, we are trying to share information information that might be useful. So where do we get this route from? Is it an IXP? Is it a transit? Or is that a route of a client? So based on that, we get information. And when we check the routing table, we will understand where the route comes from, because it might be problematic. So it's important It's important to see the origin of that route. Let's think, for instance, in the hijacking of prefixes. If you have a marking, you know that the person person who hijacked the prefix was a specific client that came from a certain IX and so on and so forth. So the information communities are useful to provide us information that can also be useful to export. And I can imagine, for instance, that we want to have the routes of our clients and that it may go to the exchange point. We generate the community for the client and we're going to use only those routes, mine and the clients. We have to check whether they have been inside or not. Communities are very helpful and help the network administrators. Regarding the information communities, it is important to see how we're going to submit the information. Lucas had referred to this. There is no just one single defined standard, but we have a suggestion. And this suggestion is to include information in each of those digits. For example, we have the type of relation, which is the first digit where it comes from. It's from this continent, from this country and so on. That is why in the routing table, you will 
see where they obtained this route, what country it's come from, what state, from what region. As we were saying that this information is for you, it is also important that you should not allow other users to transmit information. That is why we speak about filters. Let us assume that we want to ex export transit that you're paying for. And if anyone is doing peering with you, and if you are uh, uh, if you send something and you accept this, then you will be passing this route based on a policy done in the configuration of your router, and then you will end up becoming free transit. So this might lead to problems in terms of routing. So the information communities are to share information with you. So avoid the confusion between information and action communities. So let us one look at the examples. Information communities have five digits. So we know that this is an informative community because the action communities only have contained four digits. So this will allow you to see what is happening with your routing, and it makes it easier to understand. Now I give the floor to Wanderson, who will speak about the action communities. Now, we know that we can use the communities in order to work with traffic engineering, and this is precisely the purpose of this workshop that we are having today. So we can make decisions based on certain data, like Lucas and Eduardo explained. Now, we can also take actions with these action communities. These action communities will allow us to manipulate the attributes that Lucas was referring to a while ago. In this way, we can add and we can modify the prepend. We are increasing the AS path, in other words, the path of the autonomous system. So if you wish to extend this path for whatever reason, you're going to add two, three, or four prepends. And this is what you also do with the communities. You're going to select those options. And in that way, you will be going from that route to another scenario, which will be worse. So we'll be having an influence on that transit and where it goes through and how it comes back. This will allow you to modify some of the attributes. For example, if we export or we don't export a given route. And we can also do this with the action communities. So let us assume that we don't wish to pass on a route for a geographical reason, like we see here. For example, you don't wish to share this route, to uh, use this route for an international point. He explained that this was a transit route or a traffic exchange route. So we have to consider what applies depending on the routing policy. So we're going to use a community in order to avoid this or prevent this from happening. Or we can also allow this for one specific autonomous system, because it is only that autonomous system that needs it. So we're going to include this community, this stamp, as I was saying. So it has a demarcation, and we're going to allow it only for that autonomous system. Now, once again, these are some examples. These are cases where you yourselves can create. You can create your own communities. You have the IANA list or communities used by IANA, but you should also standardize this. So here we have some examples regarding how we can do this. In this case, we can select the function. In the first field, you're going to define which is the ASN and what is the function you wish. For example, not export to the neighbors of a given country. So we're going to create a specific code for that purpose. Or don't export to another X ASN. So this is a specific code. I'm going to enter that, and we will know for example, how to add a prepend for the neighbors of a given autonomous system. So these are codes that we are creating, 
with demarcations and stamps in order to understand this. We're going to create this, and we are also going to need to disseminate this. We can clarify that these are the communities and that those clients may use this. Now, this is because they need to know that you are working with the communities and with which communities you are implementing this, which are the codes, and also request to you to undertake specific action. So all this will be automated so that it is not necessary to uh, so you don't need to change things every time in the BGP. So you would otherwise have to make send emails or make calls or send WhatsApp messages. So whichever communication modality you have. But is this really necessary? Because if we implement a community and if that community is already generating this, we only have to duplicate the route in BGP with a community and this will be then automated for transit. And the transit already knows how to work with this community. and. Above that, it will apply a given action. So in that way, this is being automated. And this is a service that in the past we required and for which we required a direct contact. So now this has become automated. So, when you automate it, that is what happens. Oh. So, going back, we can use the second part for additional specific information. We enter a code that is not, don't export to the ASs in Brazil. So, this does not export for the specific AS, or you add a prepend in the other AS. So, you can do your prepare your own communities. It is important to state to your client which are the community list and which you created so that you can use this and then include the information in a clear way. So this is practically what I told you. You should publish and document the information on your communities. This will help you to the debugging process. Imagine you have a large device. Someone is using a community that they implemented, but they have not documented this. So it's important to document this as well. This will be useful for the filters. So you should encourage your clients to filter that communities of action when they join. So this is a so this will then be used to take actions. This you should provide a looking glass that shows these communities. So we can just speak about IX now. IX.br has communities. Here you might not see this very well from where you're seated, but this table is in the website of the IX in the documents part. Maybe we're going to include the link where we took this. We're going to update this material so that the link is also available for you to consult. So these are the communities that are applied at the IX. The first is a table with all the communities that you can use for traffic engineering. For example, not does not announce uh, to an ASN what is the code I have to use. So this is a table and you have that information. This is for the standard, for the extended, and for the large communities. So we can work with each of the three types of communities. We can add a prepend or two prepends or three prepends. We have also the graceful shutdown community. And these do not announce to a given RIR, for example, Afrinic, Ayupinic, Arin, Lacnic, Ripe, or Brazil. Or this can also be used to export to a given RIR. So we have all these communities, and this has been published in the website of the IX. You can all access this information. 
and the IX implements this. If I'm connected to the IX, I can use these communities. So here you can see the communities that are accepted by the IX. You have the codes and everything else. Everything has been published, and this is what we referred to in the previous slide. So you should publish the communities you create, and you can use these for your autonomous system so that your clients know how to use this. And as we will see later on, we managed to have quite a large influence on traffic just through the use of communities. Here we have some more communities that are available in the IX. Now let us, we'll speak again about this. Do not allow, announce to laws more than 2% or 10% and different milliseconds or add a prepend. So one, two, or three prepend. See the things that you can do. Then we have the communities that will do all this whenever necessary or following a given policy of the company these policies that you apply then to your autonomous system. Here we have more communities, we have more codes. Don't announce if there is packet loss of more than 2% or more than 10%. We also have options for, for example, do not announce to loss equals unknown. So all these are things that we can measure, and you can include this in the traffic. Or, for example, you can decide not to choose that path because you might lose packets. So in addition to the communities, we have informative communities. These are the first types of communities that Lucas referred to. These contain information and will this is just for the purpose of information. So you decide then what you will do with this information. You can check the path, you can look at the origin and so the, we have this community that tells us about the different options. This is an APNIC ASN, or they might say this is from AFRINIC or IREN or RIPE or LACNIC or from Brazil. So you can then look at this. We can look at the codes and then decide what this code is. Now, when we start working with this, you can learn it so rapidly that at a glance, you know what this is all about. You can say, well, this is from an ASN from Brazil, or this is from an ASN from ARIN, or from any other RIR. So what we managed to do is to have this information just at a glance for this community and without having to make any major efforts to see the information. We also have some communities which are the filtering communities. This is the, the most famous one, is a black hole community. Everyone is asking if there's also asking if there's a black hole at a given IX if this has already been implemented. We have a black hole community all over the different places in Brazil. We already implemented this in Brazil. And we'll speak later about this and we'll explain how the black hole community is used at the IS. We have the black hole community. We mark this, we can look at a community and then we can know whether the RPK is valid or not valid or a no. And we also highlight this so that all the participations, the participants, sorry, that are in the IX in Brazil can manage to see this. Based on this information, you can filter more routes that have invalid RPKI. So this is yet further information that you can use. We highlight these communities once again. So you can use this for all the different participants of the Brazilian IX. Some of the communities uh, can use this information. You, you can use this information provided by the communities. Here we have the location ID. 
uh, we have uh, the uh, the code and with this we can find the location so with this you are going to have your community 65004 uh, this uh, is the direct code for uh, Fortaleza and you know that this is a community that says uh, do not announce to this IXP so if so, with that, you can see where this came from, and this makes it much easier. It's the life of the uh, network administrators. It's not so easy, you see. So, but a bit closer in the list. And now we'll see. Uh, we we'll, we are going to see some case studies. So, and uh, with this, um, we use communities. And uh, one of the things that is interesting that I'll say here is that we bring out uh, communities of IXBR, uh, and I wanted to present these communities that are well structured. You know that here we have many people from other IXPs, and you see how interesting it is to use communities for the network administrators to make the most of the uh, internet exchanges. And these communities here, as uh, here we have a part of traffic engineering that we were saying. So I'm going to disclose to my for my my route, and I'm going to ask them to help me. For instance, here imagine uh, I can say put this for a participant. Uh, put. Uh, uh, pretends for a participant that lost a package. So, and help uh, the, uh, and uh, take some action. So I ask uh, the route server to help for those that are saturated with a problem due to loss of packets or because of the high latency. And uh, so, here, I have to think that the route server is giving information to to, to the client. So, in those uh, those routes are marked. So, so if uh, the uh, that is a route that comes through a path that has latency, has delay, has loss of packets. So with this information, we can make a decision. So of the routes that uh, are received, clearly we have this route. Then we have this idea of the attributes that I was telling you about the local reference. We can change the attribute. So if there is some saturated link, we are going to worsen the route. So we'll, it will bring me this information. It also brings information that might be useful. Where did the route come from? It came from Brazil, from this where or that I may accept it or not. And also, it makes some communities uh, there's, there are some communities where actions are made. There are uh, filters. They speak of a black hole. And we're going to see more cases, but notice that it will bring uh, information and it will act on the information. It will act based on that um, uh, the information. So this is very good, the communities, because it really helps uh, network administrators. It's something very important for the people that work with Internet Exchange. Some of them are small. They are uh, in, hosted in other countries. And thinking of, please consider put, uh, uh, um, uh, creating these communities, because they are are of help for the uh, network administrators. And e if you are in Brazil, and if you're connected in Brazil to the Internet Exchange, you are, I was showing everything we have, but it is not everywhere that we have it. Not in all the locations do we have the communities. They are in the process of being implemented. We have to enter the BR site and look at the, sp uh, at the spreadsheet of LAC IX, and you'll see there all the communities. We can say that there's a black hole, but as a matter of fact, there's only it's only uh, 
telling the limits, but it's not acting because it's still being implemented. The idea is that everybody should have it in the future, but it's important always to check before you use it and to wait for some results. I would like to call Tiago to complement with the case studies.
no margin. Well, so we have examples of things that don't work. So we can have a latency and communications of milliseconds. And finally, as there's no margin for negotiation, you wanted to negotiate for everything to go to the south without letting any assistance from the other side. So the packet will run at um, 600 milliseconds instead of 40 milliseconds. What could be provided close to you finally was provided from very far away. So not always is it good to have have such an impact putting the more specific or the less specific route. When we work with the attributes, we can do traffic engineering much easier and better. And now we'd like to comment about the communities that help us make decisions about what is closer and what is more distant. The RTT communities will measure latency. <coughs> Seeing the IX, it has uh, multiple participants from several regions in our country. Here I'm putting the ones in Brazil, and sometimes it is very far from the route server. So the router has a distance, and that distance will be reflected in the communication. Those 400 milliseconds, 90 milliseconds, 120 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds. So as soon as we see the IX, we see which are the uh, closer connections and the others that are more distant. So when the participants are already participating in the ICX, uh, we'll see that as a basis at the time when deciding the routes, because if it's far, there's not much they can do as to the milliseconds. So when you enter the IX, you can see that some routes have been announced and they will have information communities that is what we show here in the lower corner of the page. Um, because, because of the latency, we already know that that link is a bit far. So we can think we can have an impact on the traffic based on those latencies. So just to give you an example, there we have the routes announced by ASN2, AS2, that it has its IX at 20 milliseconds, that is close. And then the other one in the south at 300 milliseconds. When, so when this route is good, then it marks it and it will say, well, this route here at the north will get in the community uh, 64662 because it's between 10 and 50 milliseconds while the other one at the bottom is too far. So it says, well, I'm going to mark that it has a very high latency and that is 6467. So the IX receives the route of the participant will go with the community and will re uh, forward this uh, the information to you and you may take that information and decide upon it. You may not des uh, decide anything but you may also uh, decide something. So making a decision might be uh, doing a good traffic engineering. I can improve or worsen the route I received with local preference. For instance, I could say, OK, that uh, uh, route at the bottom in the south that has 250 milliseconds, I'm going to worsen that. I'm going to reduce its local preference. It will be no longer be preferential for this traffic to be solved locally. And notice that I'm deciding that not it's it's not generic everybody has to secure it through the traffic of the ix at the north but i'm evaluating latency i'm evaluating the distance between the other uh, route server so that is already helpful so i receive the upper and the lower routes and i decide based on the local preference so uh, having understood how we measure things we must remember that it's not a static measurement, for instance, being connected to the IX and the link to the route server. And 
they, it is stated that it takes them 200 milliseconds. It's always going to be 200 milliseconds because in the end, that link can get saturated. It may have a problem and maybe in the community it is measured now and then regularly. Now, if a problem were to appear, we can worsen that route. So in the past, we had 20 milliseconds to talk to the route server in the previous case, but uh, it got saturated or all the routers not very well, and it started to worsen. So the link started to be to show that uh, there are delays. So it's no longer 200 milliseconds. The route server will realize that because they will be deleting things in the IX and will change the community. In the past, we had 64, 662, and now we're going to have 64, 663. And you, as participants, are going to receive the information, and you'll understand that the link has uh, worsened. And the participant may decide to make it even worse. So if your entry policy is very important, once you decide to create that configuration, as Tiago showed, you already pre-established that in your route. When a problem appears with some participant, what will happen? The route server will identify the measurements, will change the community, will inform without touching the configurations. We will worsen the route because we have already left everything established because always 64662, the local preferences. If it's 64663, it's a local preference and even worse. So the owner of the route will see where they can and insert it in the community and will decide what to do and will further worsen the route. The good thing about these RTT communities is that they can be pre-configured and left there to rest in the router because if there are any changes with a saturated link with any problem, automatically they will intervene in the traffic so that no links will be are found. So there will, that will give me a different uh, traffic engineering looking for other options. It could be through other, another IX that has a better link or also because of its own transit. And there, we, as we look at the case, uh, uh, we, we talked earlier of uh, the routes received. I can also send my uh, routes. I want to send it and uh, the link that has the highest latency. I want my route to worsen because I don't want to talk too long there. Why? Because I have better paths. So I can use, for instance, there for over 10 milliseconds, we do prepend over 50 million and it goes up to over 250 milliseconds. We put two prepends. So I look at the table and see what I include in my route to send to the server. So I send the route and I check with the community at the north. I send a prepend because I think that the RTT, which is more than 10 but less than 50, I want to worsen it just a little bit. So I send this to a community at that IX. They will see it and then we'll add a prepend and increase the IS path and the number of hops that I will notify AS2. Now, the one at the bottom with that community, if it is more than 250 milliseconds, I want you to include more prepends. For example, two prepends. So the path to the route server at the bottom will see that for the one that has 300, 300, 300 seconds has to be have more prepend. So I wanted to well, participate to make it worse. So I have my route with different types of communities because when you can establish as many as you wish. And this is so that the route server can make its decisions. So it works as follows. If it has more than 10 milliseconds but less than 50 to add one, it has more than 250 milliseconds, it should add two. And this is something that I enter in my route and I send it to the two. The first one will say, my link has 20 milliseconds, so I will only put one prepend. The one at the bottom will get two prepends. So I'm going to make 
part of my traffic work as follows. And the same with the other ASNs that are further below, which can be closer to the IX in the south compared to the IX in the north. So we have traffic through traffic through the IX in the south. This is how we do traffic engineering. In addition to RTT, we can also consider the lost communities. So problems do occur, and the AS2 has communication with the IX, which is way up in the north, and has problems. There is a 20% packet loss. So this is quite bad already. So there will be a lot of retransmission of packets, and even to for the information that is going through. So they will last whether it is worthwhile using a link that has such a big packet loss. So we can consider we're going to enter information in order to make decisions on the route I receive from that place. So AS2 is sending routes to the IX in the north and the south. The one in the south doesn't have any packet loss, so the route server will mark in the community that that path is okay. Now, the one at the north sees that there's a 20% loss, so that will be announced as a bad route. So I can receive this route and obtain this information. Uh, so with that information, I can take measures. So I can work with local preference. I can just say that the routes with high packet loss above 10%. I can mark these so I will worsen that path. I will reduce the local preference so that my traffic can go through a place which is farther away but doesn't have such a big packet loss. So here I have an influence on the outbound traffic from the routes I received from AS2 through the route server. Now, to better understand the point on losses, we have problems that might be intermittent problems. Now, an important thing that we should highlight is that when we have the TCP protocol, we have retransmission. So packet loss has a consequence in terms of communication latency. So there we can have a problem that can become bigger. If there is a lot of packet loss, this will require me to retransmit things, and TCP will become slower. And also because the speed curve will be reduced because of packet loss. So the path can be even worse, and then it is not worthwhile to use it. And then we have, as I said, packet loss. This happens every now and again. So if the policies have been defined, we can once again say that if you receive a route that has a packet loss higher than 10 percent, I say, well, I don't want to receive this route. I'm going to worsen it because there's a better path. So if this is pre-configured correctly, then our router, once it receives the information from the route server, will then be able to make a rapid decision. In this way, they will decide to send the path through a better path. So it's important to pay attention to these losses because very often this is goes hand in hand with latency. So we're saying just now, we're speaking about the received routes, but we can also work with the announced routes. So here I have my AS1. I'm going to send it to the IX. And let me remind you, we have 20% packet loss in that link. So I can tell routes, tell the route server that for that participant that has a problematic link, we want to include three prepends or not to announce it. Maybe we don't even want to announce it. We don't want to speak with them in the IX. We prefer to speak at the level of transit because there might be another option or another connection that is better. So we start considering what we could do. Now, if we have two IXPs, this could be provided by the one in the low, uh, lower down because it might be longer. The latency, this generates latency in the communication. So in that case, you can receive a more negative point compared to latency as such.
So in that case, I can tell the IX to take my route and to have a prepend three. This will have an influence on the traffic. Let me remind you that IX is not positioned in the middle of the path with the ISPs. And uh, sorry, in the path to the autonomous system. So we are making decisions together with the communities. We can also consider some of the preferences that could be useful. Communities can add loss with latency. So we might wish to have three prepend to loss when this is more than 10% uh, packets. Or we wish to add three prepends to RTT when we have links that are above 250 milliseconds. So the path of the autonomous system is quite word, quite bad with three with six prepends. So the AS path will have six hops and that road will be far worse. Now the routes that you receive in these cases, you consider having other local preferences. You might have communities that include a local preference stating that you have almost non-existent priority or very low for that path. So this can, that route can be even worsened. So these are some of the preferences that you consider when you are communicating with several traffic exchange points. So thinking about the Brazilian IXs that already have these communities and communities that are organized, that is why we wish to share these examples with you. Now there are other traffic exchange points that have other types of communities which you can also use. So here we have just the cases we have in Brazil because this is what we work on at NICVR and with the IXOPR. So this is what we had to share with you today. These are some scenarios. There are many, many more scenarios. We cannot include each of these because each one has its own specificities. But we wanted to share with these with you in general terms. This is traffic information and traffic exchange points. So we now open the floor to questions maybe from remote participants or also from the participants here in the room. We're happy to take any questions. So these are our contact details. If you have any questions, please get in touch with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for this tutorial. We now invite you to go to the first floor. We have a coffee break. And when we resume at 4.30 sharp to resume the agenda, with the agenda.